the fall of 1888. And the streets of London were in a state of frenzied terror, stalked by the evil presence of a depraved monster intent upon bloody murder, stealthily scouring the cobbled streets and dark narrow alleyways for his next victim. A serial killer was moving amongst the poverty-stricken folk of London's East End, and although not one of them could pick out the face of the knife-wielding fiend, there wasn't a soul in the district unfamiliar with his name. Even the whisper of Jack the Ripper struck fear into the hearts of the brave, and the cold steel of his blade forever silenced those unfortunate enough to encounter him in person. To this day, we are none the wiser, no closer to discovering the identity of this nightmare character than were the London policemen taunted by Jack the Ripper's increasingly vicious crimes more than a century ago. And that's the key to our story. This is one of history's greatest unsolved mysteries, with, of course, Conspiracy theories abounding. It's a conspiracy! How often has that cry been heard throughout the ages? The dictionary actually defines conspiracy as a secret plan to carry out an illegal or harmful act. And in Jack the Ripper's case, both adjectives most definitely apply with many more damning indictments beside. As you can see for yourself, a whole host of books have been written upon the subject, ranging from the factual to the fanciful, and the number of ripperologists who avidly follow every development to arise grows with each passing year as new generations of amateur sleuths try to unravel the mystery surrounding Jack the Ripper. Take a look at the various suspects, and you'll soon realise the extremes to which the theorists will go. Was he a butcher, a baker, or candlestick maker, as the children's nursery rhyme inquires? Or did he come from a much higher station in life? Perhaps he was a native Londoner, a cockney born within the sound of bow bells, or maybe an American, or even a Polish immigrant. Whether Gentile, Jew, Catholic, or Protestant, one thing's for certain, no faith would want to claim the soul of this black-hearted criminal. It's even been suggested that Jack might have been a Jill. And, amazing as it might sound, the aged Queen Victoria herself was considered by some to be a possible suspect. So be warned, this is without doubt a compelling mystery, and once you start investigating, it can become positively addictive. Jack the Ripper Conspiracies has not been designed to provide the definitive solution to this age-old whodunit. All the facts, and in fairness possibly a modicum of fiction as well, will be presented in context, and the rest, as they say, will be down to you. Part of the explanation for the incredible Jack the Ripper phenomenon is the fact that no matter how many esteemed criminologists have gone before, each new investigative mind that tackles the subject truly believes that they can figure it out and solve what was most definitely 
the crime of the 19th century. To begin then at the beginning, our destination is London, England, and to be more specific, the district known as Whitechapel. This is the east end of the city, a side of London that the average tourist never gets to see. With such attractions as Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, and now the dramatic London Eye to entice visitors westward, few venture this far out, except perhaps for those in search of a bargain at the famous Sunday market held in Petticoat Lane. There are no green parks here or fine specimens of architecture to impress, and the overall atmosphere is that of a rather run-down area, with an interesting modern-day ethnic mix, and a past as darkly sinister as you're ever likely to find anywhere. For anyone on the trail of a conspiracy, or as in this case, a veritable plethora of conspiracies, it is essential from the outset to establish as many facts as possible. Jack the Ripper did not suddenly appear on the streets of Whitechapel. The story grew over a period of months, and particularly in the early stages, it can be tricky to piece the jigsaw-like fragments of information together. When a woman's body was found in what was then known as George Yard on the morning of the 7th of August 1888, nobody took an awful lot of notice. To set the scene for you a little, this was not a pleasant place to be in the late 19th century, and only those who quite literally had nowhere else to go eked out a squalid existence on these dark, desperate streets. Poverty in the East End was simply a fact of life, and degenerative behaviour, depravity and law-breaking were just everyday occurrences. Prejudice was widespread, with a high proportion of foreigners settling in the area. The 1840 Irish potato famine that drove so many from their native land resulted in an influx of 300,000 Irish immigrants to London's East End. Also, there was a thriving Jewish community within the district, as at least 90% of the Jews who resided in London made their homes in this part of the city. Anti-Semitism was rife, riots were commonplace, and the police were certainly kept busy trying to control the explosive mix of immigrants who lived side by side with the poorest of native Londoners. Matters were made considerably worse because prostitution flourished in the East End. In the late 1880s, Whitechapel possessed 63 brothels and 233 common lodging houses. Many of the women who plied their trade here were down-and-out alcoholics who worked the streets to earn enough money for their next glass of gin and a bed for the night in one of the sordid doss houses. It was a dangerous existence, fraught with risks. Violence and street brawls were occupational hazards, and once darkness fell upon the slums of Whitechapel, drunkenness and depravity lurked on every street corner. 
If someone cried murder, it's unlikely that anyone would have heard them, let alone rush to assist, which is why the body of a dead prostitute set few alarm bells ringing on that August morning over a hundred years ago. Today, George Yard has been renamed Gunthorpe Street, and although much has changed, there are still some distinctive Victorian London landmarks to pick out. The body that was discovered on the first floor landing of George Yard buildings belonged to Martha Tabram, also known as Turner. There's some dispute as to whether she was actually the first victim of Jack the Ripper, but the modern consensus of opinion generally agrees that this was accepted at the time to be the first in a series of killings collectively termed as the Whitechapel Murders. Martha was a classic example of the type of woman to be found working as a prostitute in this district. At the age of 39, she'd been an alcoholic for years and could in no way have been described as an attractive person. In death, Martha's remains made a sorry sight, and the resident who discovered her was forever haunted by what he'd seen. She'd been stabbed 39 times in the chest, throat and abdomen, in what had undoubtedly escalated into a frenzied attack. Life was cheap. Prostitutes were literally to a penny, and Martha Tabram's tragically sordid end was of little or no consequence to anyone. Reconstructing Martha's last known movements gave the police few clues about her murderer. She'd spent the evening drinking with a fellow prostitute by the name of Pearly Poll, and the two women were by all accounts uproariously drunk. They noisily went off with a couple of soldiers, or some say sailors, that they'd solicited. Poll went with her man to Angel Alley, this dingy side street where she could perform her services up against a wall. Martha was accompanied to George Yard and was never seen alive again. The police failed to track down the two men, even though it was assumed that Martha's client had most probably been responsible for her gruesome demise. August 1888 passed off without further incident in our story of Jack the Ripper. But on the evening of the 30th, a dockyard fire painted the London skyline blood red, heralding the opening of the next ghastly chapter in this twisted tale. early hours of August the 31st, a market porter by the name of Charlie Cross set off for his work. As he walked into Bucks Row, now renamed Durwood Street, his curiosity was aroused by what he assumed to be a tarpaulin, a canvas cart cover rolled at the roadside. On closer inspection, the bloodied body of a woman lay at his feet. The police quickly attended, and the doctor pronounced that life was extinct. It was only when the corpse was undressed at the mortuary that the true extent of this horrific murder was realised. 
Despite pathology skills being basic to say the least, the post-mortem revealed that the victim had most likely been strangled before having her throat cut from ear to ear. The stab wounds that had then been inflicted upon the poor woman's abdomen could only be described as absolute mutilation and had unquestionably been the work of a complete and utter madman. Identified as Mary Ann Nichols, better known in the district as Polly, it was soon realised that another prostitute had been brutally murdered, and as the events leading up to her death were investigated, the similarities with the killing of Martha Tabram started to come into focus. Polly Nichols was 43 years old when she died, and just like Martha, had been an alcoholic fallen upon hard times. On the night of her death, she'd arrived at a lodging house very drunk and most probably disorderly at 18 Thrall Street. Little remains of the Victorian atmosphere today. A curry house stands on the corner that was once the frying pan pub and at the other end of the road only the arched entrance distinguishes this modern housing estate. The hostel superintendent turned Polly away because of her inebriated state and the fact that she did not have the fourpence required for a bed for the night. Setting off into the dark streets of Whitechapel once more to earn enough money to pay her way, Polly never returned, the only resting place for her proving to be a mortician slap. If Martha Tabram's murder failed to put the prostitutes of Whitechapel on their guard, the ghastly death of Polly Nichols following four weeks later certainly did. An evil fiend was on the loose, capable of unspeakable violence, and the threat posed by the Whitechapel murderer became very real indeed. There'd been almost a month between these first two murders, but there was no such respite after Polly Nichols was killed. Before the unfortunate woman was even cold in her grave, the body of yet another prostitute was discovered in a Hanbury Street backyard. Today, a brewery car park covers the place where the mortal remains of Annie Chapman were found in the early hours of September the 8th. However, these old photographs do give you a pretty accurate idea of how the district looked in 1888. Although there was no public access to the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, the fact that Annie Chapman ended up there is no great mystery in itself. The address was home to as many as 17 people, which meant that the front door was always left open, providing a thoroughfare to the yard. Local prostitutes were certainly privy to this information and would sneak through with their clients to perform a fourpenny trembler against the back wall of the house. It's possible that this is what Annie Chapman did on the night of her murder, but equally in the darkness of the early hours, the body could have been brought here if Annie had been killed elsewhere, without anyone noticing anything untoward. 
just before 6am on the morning of the 8th of September 1888, John Davis, one of the house residents, who was another market employee, went into the yard as he got ready for work. Annie Chapman lay dead before him, her butchered body left as the grisly calling card of an insane and vicious killer. The handkerchief about her neck hid the fact that she'd almost been decapitated. But her intestines were on full display, bizarrely rearranged outside her abdominal cavity, tossed casually over her shoulder. Davis immediately alerted the police, running to the Commercial Street police station. In the short time it took them to get back to Hanbury Street, a crowd had started to gather, with some local residents charging sightseers a penny to view the mutilated body. There were a number of things of note that did in the first instance appear to be clues as to the murderer's identity. Most significantly, a wet leather apron lay screwed up near to Annie Chapman's body, and neatly placed by her feet were a number of her possessions, including two farthing coins. Also, Annie was known for wearing two rings made of brass, which had been torn from her finger and were nowhere to be found. police of the day, there were certainly more leads to be investigated than there had been in the case of Polly Nichols. But Detective Inspector Frederick Aberline, who headed the inquiry into the Whitechapel murders from September 1888, stated that he was in no doubt that the same person had committed both murders. If the clues could lead the police to the killer of Annie Chapman, then they would also have solved the murder of Polly Nichols too. Matters were made considerably more complicated for the police by the now escalating public and press interest in the case. News of the leather apron by Annie Chapman's side quickly spread, and the finger of popular suspicion pointed at a distinctly unpleasant character by the name of John Peitzer. A Polish boot finisher of Jewish extraction, Peitzer reputedly went by the nickname Leather Apron, a garment that he regularly wore while going about his business. He was already known to the police as an abuser of prostitutes and was taken into custody. But there was a problem for those who thought they'd caught the murderer. The apron did not actually belong to Peitzer. It was in fact the property of John Richardson, the son of the owner of 29 Hanbury Street, who'd left it there some days previously. Peitzer was released and allegedly compensated financially by the newspapers that had been so quick to condemn him, but for the police it was back to square one. Every effort was made to trace Annie's final movements and there are certainly a number of discrepancies in the evidence that came to light at the coroner's inquest. Here you see all that remains of Dorset Street today, where Annie Chapman used to sleep in a lodging house when she could raise the price of a bed for the night. The man who ran the house recalled seeing her at 1.35am on the 8th of September when she was lacking the necessary funds, but declared that she'd be back later with the money. Annie was 47 years old, 
and not long for the land of the living, even if she hadn't had the misfortune to encounter the Whitechapel murderer. Her lungs were severely diseased, and she'd been particularly unwell leading up to this time. However, just like Martha and Polly before her, Annie was well known for her heavy drinking, and illness didn't stop her from spending much of her time drunk. It's been suggested that Annie was seen in the Ten Bells pub close by her Dorset Street lodging house, but this has never been corroborated. Another witness reported spotting Annie outside 29 Hanbury Street talking with a man just before she was murdered. The description was the first that the police had been given of a possible suspect. The woman described the incident quite clearly. The man was over 40, wearing a long dark cloak and a deer stalker hat. She also thought he was foreign, sometimes a term used euphemistically to imply a Jew. She heard the man ask, Will you? And Annie simply replied, Yes. It was probably the last word that the unfortunate soul spoke before her throat was cut. John Richardson the owner of the leather apron went into the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street at a quarter to five on the morning of the 8th of September to check that the cellar, where he kept his tools, had been properly locked. He sat on the back step and attempted to mend his boot, but not having a sufficiently sharp knife, he went off in search of one. He declared that there was no body there at that time, and he would have been right next to where Annie Chapman was found. If she'd been there, he could not have failed to notice. John Davis discovered Annie's mutilated corpse just over an hour later at six o'clock. The evidence proved problematic the doctor, who was called to the scene within minutes of the gruesome discovery, estimated that death had occurred some two hours previously. Had Richardson failed to notice Annie, or been mistaken about the time? Was it possible that the doctor had made an error in judging the time of death? Or was there a more sinister explanation? Could Annie Chapman have been murdered elsewhere and brought to Hanbury Street after her death? Speculation was rife, and the press fueled the public's fear still further. Then, on September the 27th, 1888, the Whitechapel murderer was given a name. The Central News Agency received a letter written in blood-red ink, claiming to be from the hand of the killer, addressed to The Boss, and signed Jack the Ripper. At first, the mocking threats were given little credence, but for the press, this was an absolute gift was one of the earliest examples of sensationalist journalism, and as a result of their efforts, Jack the Ripper quickly became a household name. In truth, it's highly unlikely that the murderer of Martha, Polly or Annie had anything whatsoever to do with this letter or any of the others that were to follow. It's far more likely that an unscrupulous journalist decided to liven up the story a little with the aid of a pot of red ink 
and a lurid imagination. However, for a police force struggling to protect the low-living destitutes of Whitechapel, this was an inconvenience they could have done without. It triggered a whole spate of hoax letters that took up far too much valuable police time in a murder case, with a killer who seemed able to disappear into the side streets and alleyways of the East End with consummate ease, evading capture at every turn. The September days slipped steadily into autumn, as the terrified communities of Whitechapel breathed a sigh of relief with each new dawn that brought no further news of Jack the Ripper and his nighttime escapades. One week, two weeks, three weeks passed, but just as people started to sleep a little easier in their beds at night, Jack the Ripper proved that he was capable of even worse atrocities than anything that had so far gone before. In the early hours of the 30th of September, a street salesman who'd been peddling his wares at a slightly more distant market than Petticoat Lane was returning home. Today, this unimposing road is known as Henrik Street, but in Jack the Ripper's day, it was a narrow row of squalid houses named Burner Street. Alongside number 40 ran Dutfield's Yard, and as the salesman with his horse and trap turned into the narrow alleyway, the horse shied and refused to go any further. On closer investigation, the wary driver discovered the body of a woman slumped against a wall at the yard's entrance. Lighting a match to see more clearly, he attempted to lift her, but her throat had been cut and blood was still flowing. Running for assistance to the nearby working men's club, about five minutes elapsed before the arrival of the police. It's very likely that the killer was still in the yard when the horse shied and the horrendous discovery was made, but the subsequent commotion allowed ample time for the vicious perpetrator to slip away unseen into the night. Such was the impact of the stories about Jack the Ripper in Whitechapel that despite the late hour, Burner Street was quickly swarming with sightseers. It mattered little that the body had not suffered any further mutilation, the victim's throat had been slashed, and that was sufficient to convince the crowds that the Ripper had struck again. This 1888 Illustrated Police News, a popular journal that exclusively reported on crime and boxing, shows a very severe artist's impression of Elizabeth Stride, the Burner Street victim, that's certainly not very flattering, and possibly not very accurate either. Her mortuary picture shows that she had a fine bone structure with pleasant features, and no doubt in her youth, Long Liz, as she was often nicknamed, had been an attractive woman. People that knew her reported that despite being aged 45, she did in point of fact look some years younger. Elizabeth Stride was of Swedish extraction, born Gustaf's daughter, 
but had moved to London in the 1860s, where she'd married John Stride. The marriage didn't last, and she claimed that he'd been drowned with two of their children when the steamer, the Princess Alice, sank in the Thames at Woolwich in 1878. It was a tale undoubtedly used in the hope of encouraging charitable donations, and it was far more romantically appealing to Victorian sentimentality than the truth. By 1882, it's thought that the couple had already parted company, and in 1884, John Stride actually died of heart failure in the Bromley Sick Asylum. Just like the previous victims, Long Liz made her living as a prostitute and was well known for her hardened drinking habits, having been prosecuted at least eight times by the police for drunkenness in the year leading up to her death. However, it would seem that she was more intelligent, or at the very least, better educated than the average Whitechapel prostitute. Although well known locally for her Swedish origins, Long Liz spoke perfect English with no discernible accent whatsoever, and the fact that she was also fluent in Yiddish certainly placed her a cut above the average Martha, Polly or Annie of the East End. And now, our story of Jack the Ripper really does take its most remarkable and bizarre turn to date. Having been disturbed, the killer, if indeed it was Jack, had been unable to satisfy his bloodlust further. And it was an issue that he was very soon to address. At a quarter to two on the fateful 30th of September, a further cry of bloody murder went up just a short distance away from where Long Liz's body lay still warm in Burner Street. This is Peter Square, today one of the most atmospheric of all the murder sites, despite the modern buildings that mark the boundaries. It was here that P.C. Edward Watkins made his gruesome discovery of the body of Catherine Eddowes, as horrifyingly mutilated as Elizabeth Stride had remained untouched. Washed by today's rain, these cobblestones upon which the poor woman's remains were discarded are the only original feature to be seen in the square. A 12th century priory complete with cloister once stood upon this site, and there are some spine-chilling ghost stories told about a homicidal monk whose spirit, by all accounts, still walks these now quiet streets. But it was no phantom menace that Catherine Eddowes encountered on that fateful night, and the danger she found herself facing was very real indeed. This mortuary picture of Catherine Eddowes makes for uncomfortable viewing. But when you realise that her corpse has been hooked up against the mortician's wall, it's easier to interpret, even if it's as equally unpleasant to contemplate. Facially, the mutilations were extreme. And this proved very difficult for the police when it came to identification. In fact, it took until the 2nd of October for Catherine's common-law husband to come forward and give the Ripper's latest victim a positive identity. The police surgeon's zigzag stitching hides the internal damage inflicted upon Catherine, 
with most of her womb, bladder, and an entire kidney all missing. However, just as in the cases of Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, and Elizabeth Stride, the cause of death had been due to her throat being cut. And at the post-mortem, it was recorded that expiry had probably been mercifully immediate. Tracking the final days of Catherine, or Kate as she was often better known, is full of tragic irony. She and her partner, John Kelly, had been hop-picking in Kent, a late summer seasonal pastime for many poverty-stricken EastEnders. She and Kelly had split up to go to separate lodging houses, and when Kate returned to her usual workhouse haunt, she told the deputy in charge that she'd come back to earn the reward offered for the apprehension of the Whitechapel murderer. She thought she knew who he was. The deputy was somewhat concerned that she might become a victim herself if she wasn't careful, but Kate assured him that there was no fear of that happening. On the morning of the 29th of September, John Kelly and Kate met up after she'd pawned a pair of his boots, giving them enough money for breakfast at his Thrall Street lodging house. Later in the day, Kate went off to find her more prosperous daughter in an attempt to borrow money, but she failed to make contact. By 8.30 in the evening, however, Kate must have got money from somewhere, as Constable Robinson of the City Police Force found her as drunk as could be, trying to sleep on Oldgate High Street, and she couldn't even give the disconcerted lawman her name. Kate was taken to Bishopgate Police Station and locked in a cell to sober up. When she woke at about 12.15am on the 30th of September, a little more compass mentis, she asked to be released. At one o'clock she was sent on her way, and as we now know, just three quarters of an hour later, she lay dead and butchered in Mitre Square. There's one last sighting of Catherine Eddowes, which must have been literally minutes before her unsavoury end. Shortly after half past one, Kate was seen in church passageway leading into Mitre Square, talking to an unknown man. She had her hand upon his chest as they conversed, and three independent witnesses verified this. It can only have been her killer, and undoubtedly the men who were all on their way home from the nearby Imperial Club caught a glimpse of Jack the Ripper himself, if only fleetingly, in the dark and dusky shadows. Taking the evidence from these men, and combining it with the statement from the policeman who discovered Catherine Eddowes' body brings a number of interesting facts to light. P.C. Watkins, while out on his normal patrol, passed the corner of Mitre Square at 1.30am when there was nobody about. Kate was then seen with her mystery man just moments later, but when P.C. Watkins returned a quarter of an hour later, she lay dead in the light of his lamp. The killer must have literally taken minutes to slash Kate's throat, mutilate her body, and then completely unnoticed flee the scene. However, 
The precision with which her kidney and other body parts had been removed suggested that the murderer must have had at least a rudimentary knowledge of anatomy. And despite the ferocity of the attack, there was certainly some method to his madness. With this information quickly becoming publicly accessible, every doctor, surgeon, vet, butcher and slaughterman in the area began to be viewed with an increasingly wary degree of suspicion. But this time there was an important clue left by the killer that was discovered within hours of Kate's death. A portion of her grubby apron was missing, and this was discovered about five minutes walk away from Mitre Square in Goulston Street. Today you'll find the now world-famous Tubby Isaacs jellied eel stand on the corner of this thoroughfare into the Spitalfields district. But on that dark September night, there was nothing so light-hearted to be found here. The torn apron lay discarded in a Goulston Street doorway, having most probably been used to carry Kate's kidney away from Mitre Square. The police were at least able to work out in which direction the killer had fled, and officers were dispatched in hot pursuit, but to no avail. The evil fiend had once again disappeared into the Whitechapel night. Yet there was something seemingly significant daubed in chalk above the doorway, which almost threatened to overshadow the fragment of apron completely. Was it perhaps a message from the killer? It read, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. It was certainly a mystery, and has remained so to this day, providing ripperologists with all manner of scope for speculation. But it is the facts that we are concerned with in this programme and the sequence of events that followed the discovery of this anti-Semitic graffiti is indeed fascinating. Before the killing of Catherine Eddowes, all of the Whitechapel murder victims had fallen within the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Police Authority, but now a conflict arose. Kate's body in Mitre Square put her into the hands of the detectives from the neighbouring City of London police. Now, naturally, in their opinion, the Goulston Street graffiti and the apron related to the city case, and they wanted to photograph the incriminating words. However, when Sir Charles Warren, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, arrived on the scene, he made the decision to wash the chalk scribblings away, believing it to be nothing more than coincidental. He felt that it might incite East Enders to riot against the Jewish community, resulting perhaps in even more lives lost. Whatever his motives and the wrongs and rights of his actions, it was a decision that cost Warren dear. There was an outcry, and he was condemned for destroying evidence. His position was already questioned, as he bore much of the responsibility in the public's eyes for not catching Jack the Ripper, and by November 1888 he'd resigned his post to return to his army career. And so it was that panic spread throughout the land, from high society to the lowly Whitechapel prostitutes. Queen Victoria herself demanded that there be better street lighting in the district and more policemen on patrol, 
and she even wrote about Jack the Ripper in her journals. But Her Royal Majesty was not alone in putting pen to paper. The red ink of Jack the Ripper appeared once more after the murder of Catherine Eddowes, but this time accompanied by a ghastly parcel addressed to George Lusk, the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. The package contained a portion of kidney which was claimed belonged to the deceased Ms Eddowes. It was confirmed at the London Hospital to be of human origin and without the benefit of modern DNA testing this was sufficient to convince many that the delivery had indeed come from Kate's monstrous killer. Nevertheless, take a word of caution here with this evidence. Although a modern day journalist would find it nigh on impossible to acquire a human kidney to promote a good story, in 1888 it would have been the easiest thing imaginable. A strategic trip around the workhouses and mortuaries could well have provided a morally questionable newsman with the kidney that George Lusk received, and it would have undoubtedly have come from the corpse of a heavy drinking East End prostitute, and such a kidney would also appear very similar to that belonging to Catherine Eddowes. This is an opportune moment to discuss 19th century medicine in a little greater depth, particularly in this district. The London Hospital along Whitechapel High Street, where the much debated kidney ended up for examination, has a very famous story associated with it. Thanks to the feature film The Elephant Man, the story of John Merrick and his appalling disfigurements is now widely known, but few people realise that it was at this very hospital that Merrick was rescued to live out his days in more comfortable surroundings. It's claimed that Dr Frederick Treves, a famous pathologist at the hospital, discovered the poor man caged like an animal in a freak show in the building opposite. Today, number 259 Whitechapel High Street is a sari shop, but in the late 1880s it was a gruesome, squalid waxworks with a freak show at the back. It was common practice for victims of physical deformity to be a source of spectacle and entertainment in Victorian England, and for the Elephant Man most of his life was spent being stared at. This is not to say that Treves didn't study Merrick once he'd rescued him, because as a medical man he certainly investigated the poor soul's condition, but he did at least afford him dignity and respect. John Merrick died just two years after Jack the Ripper's reign of terror, and this historical phenomenon does go some way to explaining the people of Whitechapel's fascination with the gory remains of the Ripper's victims. If a profit could be made from the misfortunes of others, then it was, and there was little difference between a freak shop owner charging a few pennies to view a living spectacle and an opportunist resident asking for money to allow folk to look at a murdered corpse that just happened to have been deposited in his backyard. It was the mindset of a people for whom life held few expectations and dignity was a luxury that not one of them could afford. 
Returning to our subject then, in the aftermath of the double event as the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were more commonly known, the police were finding it a struggle to maintain any dignity of their own. Throughout October 1888, every avenue of investigation was explored, but Jack the Ripper proved increasingly elusive, and with nothing positive to report, they found themselves clutching at straws. Bloodhounds were procured by the Metropolitan Force in an attempt to sniff out the culprit. Burgo and Barnaby, the canine detectives in question, were the focus of considerable press attention, and when it was alleged that they'd managed to get themselves lost, the newspaper reports were far from complimentary. Fortunately, October saw no new activity from Jack the Ripper, giving the police a chance to investigate the crimes already perpetrated. But the beast was not prepared to lie dormant for long. If the attacks on Whitechapel prostitutes had grown more vicious with the passage of time, culminating in the atrocities visited upon poor Catherine Eddowes, the next chapter in this appalling story suggests that Jack the Ripper had even greater depths of depravity to reach. On the morning of the 9th of November 1888, a rent collector banged on the door of a hovel in Miller's Court, the home of prostitute Mary Jane Kelly. Getting no answer, and suspecting that she might be avoiding paying the money she owed, he peered in through a chink of broken window. The sight that met his squinting eyes was of unspeakable horror, and he could not be sure that the blood-drenched, mutilated corpse lying on the bed was even the woman he was looking for. When you first see the scene of crime pictures of Mary Kelly, it takes a strong stomach not to turn away. But if you look more closely, you'll see no trace of the woman's identity has been left. The killer had made sure that his victim was obliterated from the face of the earth in every possible way imaginable, and it does not make for pleasant viewing. We know very little for certain about Mary Kelly, and what scanty information we do have comes from the stories she herself told. However, she was very different to the previous Ripper victims. Mary was much younger at the age of 25 than the other women, and although most definitely a hard-drinking prostitute, she was not the broken wreck that her predecessors had been. This is the Ten Bells pub at the heart of the Spitalfields Market District. Mary was often seen on the lookout for willing clients. She claimed to have come from Ireland and certainly had a fearsome reputation for street fighting, often getting into brawls with other prostitutes to such a degree that she was known to some, particularly those to have crossed her, as Black Mary. Miller's Court where Mary lived and died is no more, and we really do rely on archive pictures to get an idea of how this part of the East End looked in 1888. This White's Row car park today stands in place of what was then known as Dorset Street, and Miller's Court was a tiny narrow alleyway that ran from it. 
for some time before her death, Mary had lived there with one Joseph Barnett, but they'd separated on the 20th of October, 1888, and he'd moved out. Joseph visited Mary at Miller's Court at about 8 o'clock on the night of her death, and it was well known that the couple had fought violently in the past. The finger of suspicion did point significantly for a while in his direction. Was this possibly a domestic argument that went badly wrong? A crime of passion, as the French would call it. Whatever the truth, one thing was for certain. If Barnet had killed Mary, it would have been very convenient if the police had attributed the dastardly deed to Jack the Ripper, leaving Barnet in the clear. But here we are speculating, as was the whole world after the death of Mary Kelly. Although further prostitute murders did continue at regular intervals after this time in Whitechapel, it's widely agreed that the death of Mary Kelly marked the end of the Ripper's reign of terror. And of course, now we come to the crux of this program. All the facts have been laid before you. And now it's time to consider the conspiracies. But before going any further, it's fascinating to take a closer look at this ageing copy of Progress, a Canadian journal from New Brunswick, dated the 10th of November, 1888, the day after Mary Kelly's butchered corpse had been found. The Fascination of Blood, a fancy picture of a man who will become forever famous, is a chilling title indeed, and the article that follows rings as resonantly today as it did back in the late 19th century. Somewhere in London is living, at the time of the present writing, a gentleman who will be forever famous as soon as he has been identified. We do not know him. If we heard his name, we probably should not recognise it. But all the world will know it ere long, and it will be remembered by our children's children. He opens a secret drawer of his desk and takes out of it a knife of fine steel with a straight blade about an inch and a half in breadth, ending in a point. The edge is of razor sharpness. The blade is kept in fine condition, though the stout wooden handle is somewhat stained. He has indulged his craving. He has satiated his thirst. He has repeated the ecstasy of his triumph. He despises all other men, all other delights. He is more than ever assured that he is a messiah, a demigod, a prophet. He reaches his house. He is safe, while all the rest of the world is shuddering over the details of the last Whitechapel murder. For most people, the mention of a Jack the Ripper conspiracy has immediate royal connotations, due in part to a spate of feature films and documentaries dating back to the 1970s. However, one of the main protagonists, if this theory is to be given credence, was Sir William Gull, the royal physician to Queen Victoria and her family, first surfacing as a suspect in a Chicago newspaper in 1895. 
From quite early on, as discussed previously, Jack the Ripper was thought to have been a medical man, and most certainly in Victorian England, surgery of any description was very much feared. Here you see what an operating theatre would have looked like, with provision made for students watching the master surgeon at work. Sawdust would have covered the floor, and a wooden box was used to catch the blood. To the uneducated of Whitechapel, there was little to choose between the work of a surgeon and the murderous dissection techniques of Jack the Ripper. The longer his crimes remained unsolved, the greater the level of hysteria, leading to all manner of speculation. This is the Times obituary of Sir William Gull. He died in January 1890 after suffering a stroke. If the words written are as true as you would expect from such a quality publication, Sir William Gull led a completely blameless life, helping to heal many people, including the very highest in the land. As this wasn't the first stroke that the good doctor had suffered, investigating his previous medical history is certainly telling. Sir William Gull had his first seizure the year before Jack the Ripper's terrible deeds covered the front pages of every newspaper, and it's highly unlikely that he would have been physically capable of murder, let alone mutilation at high speed. Also, you need to consider the fact that the man was in his 70s, quite regardless of the state of his health. If it seems bizarre that a royal surgeon should be considered a Jack the Ripper suspect, then even more incredible is the 1960s story that puts forward Queen Victoria's own grandson, future heir to the British throne, as a possible Whitechapel murderer. Prince Albert Victor is not a well-known character in royal history, because early death prevented him from fulfilling his destiny, much to the relief, some would say, of certain members of his family. The first-born son of Edward VII and his Danish-born wife Alexandra, Albert, better known as Eddie, had inherited a congenital hearing problem from his mother. His speech was slurred and difficult to understand, and it's commonly known that Queen Victoria considered her grandson to be retarded, as did the unfortunate boy's father. Eddie died tragically young at the age of 28, some four years after the Jack the Ripper murders. The cause of death was given as a virulent strain of flu, but there are conspiracists who doubt the official records, suggesting that the prince committed the Whitechapel murders while insane due to the effects of syphilis, making the influenza story a right royal cover-up. However, there is an even more complex royal conspiracy theory that implicates not only the much maligned Eddie, but Sir William Gull as well. Suspicions about Prince Albert Victor, later the Duke of Clarence, might have been raised in the 1960s, but it was a decade later that this next incredible story came to prominence when researcher Stephen Knight presented his final solution. Here you see the Times obituary of popular Impressionist painter Walter Sickert, who was allegedly engaged by Eddie's doting mother, 
Princess Alexandra to find a creative outlet for her son's talents prior to the first of the Whitechapel murders. While visiting Sickert's East End studio, the young prince met and fell in love with a common shop girl. After becoming lovers, the couple were secretly married and had a child. The witness to the wedding was none other than Mary Kelly. When she realised the identity of the mysterious bridegroom, she hatched a plan to blackmail the government. The great and good of Victorian society feared a major scandal and steps were allegedly taken to ensure Mary's silence. Sir William Gull was entrusted with this task, and also to make certain that anyone Mary had told her tale to was also kept quiet. This story was recounted by an elderly gentleman who claimed to be the son of Walter Sickert, and he stated that during the painter's involvement with the tragic events, he'd never suspected the lengths to which Sir William would go in order to protect the monarchy. Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman and Catherine Eddowes were, according to this scenario, associates of Mary Kelly, and this is quite simply why they were killed. The fact that Elizabeth Stride was not mutilated after having her throat cut was due to her being the wrong woman. But the subsequent swift pursuit of Catherine Eddowes found the murderer his intended victim. Since the emergence of this story, the spotlight has also fallen on Walter Sickert as being a possible ripper suspect in his own right, much to the horror of the man who proudly claimed to be the painter's son. This resulted in a further bizarre turn when the informant recanted, saying that the tale told to Stephen Knight had been a total fabrication. The royal conspiracy theories are without doubt fascinating, pulling those from the highest echelons of society into the plot, but they do need to be considered with extreme caution as it's all too easy to tarnish the reputation of long-dead innocent men for the sake of a good story. Away from royal preoccupations, there have been any number of suspects since Jack the Ripper's autumn reign of terror. One of the most collectible books on the subject was written by Leonard Matters, and was first published in 1926, naming a Dr. Stanley as the deranged killer. Stanley's motive was revenge. In this version of events, his son had slept with Mary Kelly, contracted syphilis, and died. The story claims that the earlier victims were known associates of Mary, and Stanley had murdered them before getting to her. There's no actual evidence that Mary Kelly was syphilitic, and neither is there any conclusive proof that the dead women knew each other. It's highly unlikely that Dr. Stanley was Jack the Ripper, but Leonard Matter's book is well worth searching out, because of his insightful presentation of the facts of the individual murder cases and the Whitechapel locations where they occurred. If you look at all the publications that claim to name the real Jack the Ripper, the range of suspects is quite incredible. Montague drew it was a barrister of good family, whose body was found floating in the Thames at the end of December 
1888. The coroner's verdict was that he'd killed himself while of unsound mind. He'd disappeared at roughly the same time as Mary Kelly was murdered, and it was thought that after the atrocities at Miller's Court, the killer might well have taken his own life. Also, Druitt was said to have been sexually insane, although the reasoning behind this comment is as big a mystery as the Jack the Ripper case itself. It's most likely that Montague Druitt became a suspect because of the timing of his suicide, which certainly was the view of Inspector Frederick Aberline. For Inspector Aberline, the most likely suspect was George Hickman, a Polish immigrant with limited surgical knowledge, who arrived in Whitechapel in 1888 actually working in a basement barber shop below the White Hart pub, which still stands today on the corner of Gunthorpe Street and Whitechapel High Street. If the address sounds familiar, you'd be quite right. It's actually where Martha Tabram's body was found, as featured earlier in the programme, Gunthorpe Street being the renamed George Yard. Chapman was undoubtedly a murderer, but the question is, was he the Whitechapel murderer? Three women who he'd lived with in succession were all poisoned between 1895 and 1901, crimes for which he was convicted and subsequently hanged in 1903. Inspector Aberline commented to the man who arrested Chapman, You've got Jack the Ripper at last. There have been suggestions that the Jack the Ripper murders were all linked by black magic with the murder sites forming the mystical symbol of a pentagon when a line is drawn between them. Also, some believed that the spirit world could be reached by means of a magical ritual using the body parts of a harlot, perhaps offering a viable explanation for Jack's removal of his victim's organs. It is for this reason, and stories of his own telling, that Robert Dionston Stevenson came under suspicion as he dabbled extensively in the occult. He was certainly something of a social misfit, and he possessed a collection of blood-stained ties that he claimed had been used to conceal the body parts of the victims as Jack the Ripper made his escape. In the years since Jack the Ripper stalked the streets of London, there have been instances of new evidence coming to light, some of it genuine, but not all by any means. In 1991, a diary emerged, said to have been written by James Maybrick, a man not previously suspected in the Jack the Ripper case. The authenticity is dubious, and possibly the closest that this Liverpool-born cotton merchant ever came to murder was in point of fact his own. He died in May 1889 after a short illness, but a post-mortem revealed traces of arsenic in his body, and his wife was tried and convicted of murdering him. However, although the Maybrick Jack the Ripper diary has taken up an awful lot of the case historian's time and energy for no reward, other newly discovered documents have proved much more enlightening. Here you see 
Stuart Evans, a much respected historian and Jack the Ripper expert working as a consultant on a major Hollywood film project and it was he who discovered a letter from a chief inspector of Scotland Yard and brought it to public notice in 1993. Known to Ripperologists as the Little Child Letter, it was written in 1913 and named an American as a very likely suspect who escaped to France before he could be fully investigated. Dr. Francis Tumblety was undoubtedly a quack who allegedly had a vitriolic hatred of women most notably prostitutes. On his regular visits to London, Scotland Yard had assembled a large dossier concerning his movements and his sadistically criminal tendencies. According to the letter, Tumblety was actually arrested in London at the time of the murders, charged with unnatural offences, but released from custody on bail. It was while on bail that he absconded to France, making the suspicions about his complicity in the Whitechapel murders even greater. Whether coincidence or not, after Tumblety cheated the British judicial system, the Jack the Ripper murders ceased. The Doctor reappeared in New York in early December 1888, where the American newspapers reported his movements and his possible Jack the Ripper connection. Could it be that a quack doctor from across the Atlantic was the scourge of Victorian London? It's certainly a possibility, and definitely worthy of further investigation. Our time is almost up. The facts of the Whitechapel murders have been presented, as have the major suspects to have emerged with the passage of time. Tracing a conspiracy is no easy task, and the Jack the Ripper murders qualify as one of the most mystifying of all time. Major events in history since have acquired conspiratorial status, but none hold quite the same macabre fascination. The assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy in 1963 has proved to be one of the most significant conspiracies of the 20th century. And the death of Princess Diana in a Parisian car crash in 1997 is only just beginning to bring the conspiracy theorists to the fore. Such conspiracies as these will undoubtedly run for all time, each for very different reasons capturing the public imagination and fueled by the press a practice that really did begin with the reporting of the Jack the Ripper murders. The wily journalist who thought up the name and fabricated the Jack the Ripper letters has more to answer for than just wasting police time. He created a monster that not only disgusted but also fascinated in equal measure, giving rise to, as we've discovered through the course of this program, an abundance of Jack the Ripper conspiracy theories. 
the verdict has to be left open. The questions raised are now more than a hundred years old, and the answers have quite possibly evaporated into the mists of time. The women who died, those suspected of killing them, and the policemen and doctors charged with piecing together the evidence have all passed into the pages of history. But the image of a black cloaked fiend walking the narrow cobbled streets of Whitechapel has outlived them all. The nightmare character, exaggerated by an over-exuberant Victorian press, took shape in the public imagination. And until such time as proof positive emerges to identify Britain's most notorious killer, the Jack the Ripper conspiracies will continue to flourish and grow with every new generation that delves into the brutal reality of the East End of London's Victorian past. <laughs>